given by King William III of England in 1696, the charter for the Collegiate Churches uh, of New York. And so this building that was built in 1854, the very famous Norman Vincent Peale, I uh, was a minister here for 50 years. I had the honor of lunch today with Reverend Michael Brown, uh, who is the minister here now. The services on Sunday morning are at 11. And also Arthur Caliandro, the late Carthur Arthur Caliandro, who is the minister here for many years and was always very kind to me in my work. So for those of you who have uh, been with me since I began lecturing here in New York uh, in April, uh, had a wonderful time over at Middle Collegiate Church with Reverend uh, Jackie Lewis. You know, in my career, um, I, I started this at a time when institutional churches, a lot of them were not as open as they are now to a category they call spiritual but not religious. Uh, the Methodist churches were always very kind to me wherever I've lectured, always open. Uh, but these are, uh, these are changes in terms of who will rent to who and welcome who that I think is very good for the culture, but it's been a real blessing on me personally. So I'm grateful to all of you. I'm excited that we're here. Grateful to Gail Robinson and Michael Brown and all those at uh, uh, Marble Collegiate Church. Wonderful to feel that we have a new home. Uh, hello and welcome to all of you who I know and those of you who I don't know. And now let's get started and hopefully kick some ass tonight. Introduce yourself to the people who are near you, to your right, to your left, in front of you and behind you. Say hi. <clears throat> Now please join with me and let's take a deep breath and close our eyes. We see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light and we watch this light as it begins to grow, larger and larger until now it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. And we see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. We see a garden that surrounds the temple water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit as well by this same beautiful golden light. And here we are, for we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. We devote our time spent together and all of our relationships and experiences of one another to God and we pray that his holiest spirit be upon us lifting us above and beyond all regions of sorrow, pain, fear, and despair to the infinite love and peace that lay beyond. And so it is, together we all say, Amen. Is there anybody here who does not know what A Course in Miracles is? One person, two people, three people, okay, very quickly, because there's just a couple of you. A Course in Miracles is a set of books uh, Three books are contained in this, or three volumes are contained in this one book. It is not a religion. It calls, it considers itself and defines itself as a psychological mind training in the relinquishment of a thought system based on fear and the acceptance into our hearts and minds of a thought system based on love. It, there is no doctrine, there is no dogma. It is based on universal spiritual themes. So the way we hold it here is that there is one truth with a capital T, and it is spoken in many, many different ways. And one of the really beautiful things about being on a spiritual journey is that you read different religious texts, spiritual texts, and you notice the same themes repeated over and over again. And that's part of the fun of it all, really. For instance, tonight is the first night, it is the night of Kul Nidre, of the first night of Yom Kippur, which is the holiest uh, day 
uh, in Judaism, starting tonight at sundown and ending tomorrow at sundown. And it is called the Day of Atonement, once again, the holiest day. And atonement is a principle which is very important in A Course in Miracles. You see it in Catholicism. Uh, this is what confession is. Uh, in Protestantism, this uh, Lent embodies this principle. And of course, in the uh, study of the 12 steps uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous, the idea of taking the fearless moral inventory and admitting the exact nature of your wrongs. This is a universal spiritual theme. There is no great religious system, there is no great spiritual system that does not speak to this. So the idea of atonement, the idea of repentance, the idea of the admitting of our quote unquote sins. Now a sin, you know, if you look at it from a perspective of archery, a sin means you missed the mark. So a lot of interpretation of traditional Christianity is this idea that you sinned and God wants to punish you. Now, A Course in Miracles does not see it that way at all. To have missed the mark means to, to miss the mark, the only mark, the mark of God being love. So the only sin is loveless thought. But The Course in Miracles does not present this as something that you did wrong, therefore God is going to punish you, and maybe after you die, go to hell. A Course in Miracles is a radically different interpretation. The idea that our lovelessness is not something that God is angry at us for. It is not seen by God as a terrible thing we did for which he will now punish us, but rather a mistake that we made for which God sends his spirit to heal us. So for instance, as the Catholics go to confession and go through the individual process, I did this and I did that, and during Lent the individual does this, the Jews gather on Yom Kippur and notice that it is not just the individual admitting the exact nature of the wrongs and asking God's forgiveness. Now it's very interesting on that. One of the things that Judaism has in common with Islam that is different than Christianity is that the theology is entwined with the history of the people. So that Jews, for instance, do not just uh, atone for the sins of the individual, but for the sins of the tribe of Israel. So this notion of repentance, this notion of atonement, applies in many religious and spiritual studies, not only as something that we atone for as individuals, but that we atone for as a nation. Now you might have heard we have a presidential campaign going on, <laughs> and it is certainly in the air that something has become disturbing. Uh, we're not exactly moving through the, all the, only the joyful aspects of the exercise of democracy at the moment. We see things happening in our country uh, which are uh, not only divisive, that have violence at their core, emotional violence, psychological violence, even in many cases uh, physical violence. We see the, the real disruption and, and real, at least emotional and psychological violence of this campaign. Uh, we see violence towards the earth. Uh, in terms of our, too many of our environmental policies. We see the, the economic violence of economic injustice. We see the violence of police brutality and lack of, of, of justice in our criminal justice system. We see the violence of something like a private prison system in which you have people because they make a lot of money building prisons and actually lobby for harsher sentences because there is money to be made from people being in prison. There is lovelessness at the core of this. The Course in Miracles says that you think you have many different problems, but you really only have one, and that is your separation from God. So there's only one truth, and that is love. And the Course in Miracles says that <clears throat> the Course can be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened, and nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. So what that is saying, that both in our individual and in our collective experience, when we think with love and then behave with love, we stay within a cosmically ordered universe. It is the mind of God at work within us, and our purpose on this earth is to be vessels through which the mind of God first entering into us, as it is in every single moment, then we make a choice in every moment, 
consciously or unconsciously, whether to say yes, whether to allow our minds and our behavior and our bodies to be a vessel for the expression of that love into the world. When we do that as individuals, life works. When we do that as a nation, life works. When we do not do that, in the absence of love, the Course says fear sets in. No differently than in, the, than in the absence of love, excuse me, the absence of light, darkness sets in. Darkness then not being anything but the absence of light, which automatically disappears when light is turned on. Fear then not being a thing, but the absence of a thing which automatically disappears when love is turned on. So once again, when you see the problems in our political system, problems with the environment, problems with international terrorism, problems with any expression or manifestation of pain and violence and fear, whether it is in our own individual lives or collectively, the Course in Miracles says, to keep it very simple, complexity is of the ego. The spirit knows it's real simple. Where did, where was love, where did love prevail? And where did love not prevail? And the law of cause and effect is the basic principle by which God orders the universe. It was set up for our protection, but God himself will not violate his own law. So that means your thought, every thought you think is a level of cause, everything you experience is the level of effect. So if you see an effect that is not of your liking, what's the question? Where was the lovelessness? Now what do you do if you go, oh, I get it. Oh, I get it. I get how I caused this. Or in the, in the life of a nation, I, we get how we caused this. Where was our lovelessness? And as a nation, we have tried to keep it neutral, right? So if you say love is to be your bottom line, it's one thing to say love is to be my bottom line in my personal life. But what is it to say love should be my bottom life in the way we run our economies? What does it mean to say love should be the bottom line rather than economic principle, rather than money and short-term economic gain for anyone? So that it, there comes a point, given that so many of the problems that we face are collective problems at this point, where we must do the collective questioning and to ask ourselves, how's all this neutrality working out for us? We'll talk a little bit more about exactly how that has occurred and exactly what we need to do, but spiritually the point is we must atone. So as Abraham Lincoln in 1864, when he said, when he established a national day of prayer and fasting, and he said in his words that a nation must confess its sins just as an individual must. And so we are living at a time where there is clearly, I think, a critical mass of Americans who know that something has gone on here. Something has, something has just, you, you feel the center not holding. We've always had problems in this country and we've all often uh, throughout our history uh, behaved collectively in ways that transgressed against our own uh, purported principles. Uh, starting with slavery, of course, it lasted in this country for hundreds of years, uh, genocide uh, perpetrated against the Native American people, and so forth. So it's not like we have always been aligned with the enlightened principles at the core of our own uh, founding documents, but over time, and this is the greatness of our country, not that we've always gotten it right, but the greatness of our country in part does lie in the fact that over time, even where we have gotten it wrong, we, generations rose up and made it right. We had slavery, then we abolished slavery. There was still white supremacy entrenched in the American South, segregation in the American South. Then there was the civil rights movement. Women did not have the right to vote. Then women were given the right to vote. Gays could not marry, now gays can marry, etc. And so, just as generations before us have addressed the deeper issues of non-alignment with the truth of who we are, it is time for us to do the same. And we're living at a time where, and New York, uh, nobody in New York needs to be reminded of this, uh, given not only the, the uh, uh, terrorism that has occurred here, 
uh, but also the terrorist threats that have occurred here, the terrorism that has almost occurred here. No New Yorker needs to be reminded that these collective issues uh, become personally relevant. You know, there is really nowhere you can hide these days uh, from some of the larger collective public issues. Um, if you've got an environment where there's poison in the food or poison in the air or poison in the water, uh, there's really no way to just wall yourself off. There's no way to just say, well, I'll go live over here or I'll just be over here and it will be um, just about me and I don't have to worry about those things. We are living at a time now where if it's a public issue, if it's a public issue and it's a problem, it will get to your private door. So once again, the atonement, to simply recognize, you know, and it's, it, it's different, there's a difference between taking blame and taking responsibility. You know, I'm, I'm Jewish, I will be at a synagogue tomorrow, and I will be apologizing for every possible thing this year uh, that I, 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 I did wrong, or I might have done wrong, or the nation of Israel has done wrong, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? I will feel better at the end of the day. That's the thing. And when they, when they blow that shofar, it's so powerful. You know, this whole idea of tone and music and sound. I remember reading in a Seth book, who knows if it's true. I remember reading once about how that's how the pyramids were built, that people at that time knew how to chant in ways that actually created an anti-gravitational force field and made it easier. So who knows? But we know certainly the power of sound. We know the power of music. I was reading an article the other day about the power of silence about a, a study that they've done on the brain. This was some scientists in Finland, and they, were, they, they have found the incredible uh, beneficent effect on the brain from silence, which makes sense in terms of meditation and so forth, doesn't it? And also how you know, one of the ways they torture people is to have loud music on that never stops and so forth. So this idea uh, of the shofar, the blowing of the shofar in the Jewish synagogue is so interesting because it is the idea that God will, as the language is, give you another year in the book of life. Of course, that's symbolic. But when that shofar sounds, you really feel that the molecules have shifted. One of the reasons I'm glad we're here, you know, when you, when you were in a church, when you were in a synagogue, when you were in a mosque, when you were in a shrine, this is different than just being in an auditorium. Because there's something radical that we're talking about here, ladies and gentlemen. We're not just talking about a, a different way of looking at things. We're talking about the radical action of what in A Course in Miracles and in, in uh, uh, Christianity is called the action of the Holy Spirit. Now, in, in Judaism, this is the covenant of Israel. In Christianity, it's a radical action of the Holy Spirit. It is the idea that there is a power in us but not of us, that can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Now, let's look at this. We're talking about the fact that your life, and you think about your own life, something has gotten off the rails, right? And we've talked about how, what has happened in America when things have gone off the rails. We're certainly off the rails if you're owning slaves, certainly off the rails if you're, uh, if you're killing your indigenous peoples, certainly off the rails if you're not giving women the equal votes it's, and all of that. But that's true not only collectively, it's true of our own individual lives. So from a spiritual perspective, if something's not working in your life, you ask yourself, what was cause? What was the level of cause? Now, the ego mind, you know, the Course in Miracles doesn't teach about a devil that's out there stalking people's souls. First of all, it teaches us that there is nothing out there. That when you're talking about the realm of ultimate reality, there is no time, there is no space. You know, sometimes people say, We're not, I don't believe in a God outside myself. Well, there is nothing outside you. So God inside you, God is inside you, inside your mind, but your mind is bigger than just your separate self. So we don't believe in a, in a devil out there seeking men's souls. That's all in your minds. But if you think about it, the fact it's only in your mind is the worst place it could possibly be. <laughs> okay? So the idea of the shadow, whatever you want to call it, the force of lovelessness is called in A Course in Miracles, ego. 
And the word ego is used in A Course in Miracles the way the ancient Greeks used the word. And it is simply a belief that we are separate. If I behave in a way that is not respectful and reverent towards the earth, it's because I believe that somehow my good is separate from the earth's, which is to say that I can destroy the earth and that this will not someday destroy me. If I do not care about a child, you know, we all talk about how we have to love our children. Of course we have to love our children. But the love that will save the world today, it, it's not enough to just love our children. We have to love the children on the other side of town. We have to love the children on the other side of the world. We have to expand our dimension of what we think love is. Because why would we not? Because we think we're separate. We think that we cannot do unto others and not have them then do unto us. That's why the golden rule is just like if you want to be smart, do unto others as you would have others do unto you because they will. And if they don't, somebody else will. Why? Because that's how cause and effect operates. As a matter of fact, as, as Einstein said, and as the Course in Miracles says, time and space themselves are illusions of consciousness, Einstein said, an illusion, albeit a persistent one. It seems like if I do something to you, it's going to take a while for you to do it to me. Or the Course in Miracles would say, even if you're so enlightened, you don't get reactive and you don't do it to me, I'll still feel like you did. And it won't happen later. It will actually happen in the moment I do it because what I'm doing to you, I'm actually doing to me. And time is just a lesson which will enable me to see what I have already done. And so all that's happening here is either I am believing I am separate from you, which will lead me to think that what I do to you won't affect me, or will lead me to think that I'm better than you, or will lead me to think that I'm worse with you than you, will lead me to be neurotic about you, will lead me to feel separate from you, then will lead me to feel very lonely because I'm separate from you, then will lead me to feel if I can only find that one special romantic partner, I wouldn't feel bad. Although because I'm not having a deep relationship with you, I don't know how to have a deep relationship with anybody. So then when I get to the one that's supposedly so fantastic, I load so much pressure on this poor guy at the end of the day because I didn't know how to be with you all day. So I'm like this empty cup, fill me, fill me, well, that feels good. All these neurotic things that we go through, all the Course in Miracles says, because we are not aligned with what is true. And I said earlier that ego is complex. The Course in Miracles says complexity is of the ego. And that's why everybody goes on and on about how it's so complex. How are we going to heal the, the economic system? How are we going to heal the political system? You know, everybody right now, for instance, with politics, how did it get so bad? How did it get this way? There is no mystery here. There is no mystery here. So everybody needs to stop being like, I just don't know how this happened. <laughs> it's very clear how this happened. We became a nation of horrors. We became a nation that put short-term economic gain before humanitarian values. We countenanced the overtaking of our political system by money through things like Citizens United. We have allowed and countenanced the takeover, practically a hostile takeover of our political system by two major political parties. Even though George Washington warned us about it, political parties aren't even mentioned in the Constitution. Third party, Socialist Party came up with Social Security. Third party abolitionists came up with the ab abolition. And Suffragette Party came up with suffrage. We have countenanced all this, ladies and gentlemen. So this idea that I don't even know where all this came from is because we have bought into the myth of neutrality. The myth of neutrality is, well, I don't really want to hurt anybody. It's not enough to not want to hurt anyone. The issue is if we are not proactive in our love, and that means proactive behind everything we feel strongly about. Proactive about how we are as parents. Proactive about how we are as friends. Proactive about how we are as spouses. Proactive about how we are as lovers. Proactive about how we are trying to be better as employers and better as employees and better as people and better as citizens. And taking very, very seriously and with deep humility and sincerity and sobriety and reverence our responsibility towards the earth and our responsibility towards our country, 
We just think these, that it's all just guaranteed to us. It's not guaranteed to us. And if we are not vigilant about establishing that which is good, establishing that which is true, establishing that which is beautiful, then this idea that it all falls apart, all starts crashing down around us, and then we say, I don't know how this happened. It happened because we made a mistake. Too many of us got lured into this mindset that it's all about me, which is the ego. I'm separate from others. It's about me. And we have an economic system that has promoted this, this kind of, this kind of, you know, it's not capitalism itself. Free market, you know, that's part of the beauty of the United States. I sell books. If you buy one of my books, I get a dollar. That's great. So I understand that the free market can be a beautiful thing. But the free market, economics, like everything else, is used either by spirit or by ego. It can be used to lift people up, and it can be used to push people down. And so if we allow ourselves, this is why you have in too many situations when it comes to the new thought community and the higher, higher consciousness community, somehow the notion of a spiritually fulfilled life has become part and parcel of you can make all your economic dreams come true. This is the idea that you can go out there and make it happen is a beautiful thing. But if it's you're just doing it so for you, if it's just for you, then as we talk about here so often, we become a malignant rather than a loving and healthy participant in the affairs of the world. In the body, every cell is part of a matrix of collaboration with every other cell to serve the healthy functioning of the whole. And it, every cell is guided by a natural intelligence. Every cell is guided, you pancreas, you liver, you blood, you bones, you heart, you lungs. And when the cell is following its natural intelligence, it collaborates with other cells. And together, they make the pancreas healthy, and the lungs healthy, and the, the body healthy. But when a cell disconnects from its natural intelligence, and instead just goes off to do its own thing, and it's only about me, and I'm going to build a cell of my own little kingdom of other cells who, like me, just do what we want to do, in the body, it is called cancer. It is malignant. And what has happened on this earth is that we have been infected by a malignant consciousness, which says it's all about me. It's all about me. And if, whether it's making money or doing anything else, is all about you, it becomes a malignant element. You know, I've been so, in politics, oh my goodness, whether it has to do with disavowing a racist, misogynist candidate, blah, 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 or whether it has to do with the NRA, or whether it has to do with anything else. You hear the people on television, they keep saying, well, some Congress people and some senators, they just won't do it because they, they're worried about their own careers. Well, I want to say something to every congressman and every senator who is voting against his or her conscience because they don't want to lose their career. You're not the only profession. In fact, you're one of every profession where you make ethical decisions. And if doing the wrong thing means you'll, doing the right thing means you'll lose your career, lose your career, save your soul. <laughs> so something this is, as they say, a teachable moment. This is a moment when all of us can see that the things that have gone wrong, the things that are going wrong, did not come from nowhere. We have not taken care of the earth. So why are we so surprised? We have not put taking care of the earth before any other consideration. We have not put taking care of our children before any other consideration. We have not been living the principles and seeing the principles of, 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 of equality, of opportunity, a country of the people, by the people, and for the people. We have allowed lip service to replace deep conviction. We have not played life seriously. You know, sometimes people take themselves so seriously because they're not taking life seriously enough. It's interesting, isn't it? When you're taking life seriously, you don't take yourself so seriously. It's when you're taking life seriously and from a very sober place that you lighten up about yourself. Now, the whole idea of atonement, of confession, of Lent, of this acknowledging 
you know, whether it's in like 12 steps, you actually look at the exact nature of your wrongs. Whether you're, you're a nation or whether you are a, an individual, the idea is that God is merciful. The idea from a metaphysical perspective, such as the Course in Miracles, isn't that we've been wrong and now we're all going to go to hell after we die. The Course in Miracles says at the deepest level we never die. And hell is not something that has to do with after we die. It has to do with where the ego takes us right now. Look at how the unbelievable rate of anxiety and depression in our society. Well, if you don't live for love, you can't be happy. So the idea that we are this morally neutral society in which so many of us are taught that the highest good is just figuring out what you want and then going for it, that is a mindset that will produce anxiety and will produce unhappiness and will produce depression. Because if you're only living for yourself, which is the ego, the belief that you're separate, you might get the money, you might get the house, you might get whatever, but as Buddha said, the things of this world can only provide temporary happiness. It's our capacity to love each other, our capacity to atone for our own mistakes and to forgive others for theirs. That is the only path to happiness. Now, too many times people think, do I want to serve God or do I want to be happy? But when you look at this from a spiritual perspective, serving God means serving love. So, and the Course in Miracles teaches us you are an idea in the mind of God. That's who you are. So to serve God means to think with, your, with love, which is the only way to be yourself because love is who you are. So the only way to be comfortable in my skin is to live my life for love. And that once again, don't make it complicated. So in any situation, the Course in Miracles says, and this applies to our nation as well as to our individual lives, the principles are the same. The Course in Miracles says, we pay a very high price for not taking 100% responsibility for our lives. You can't see yourself as a victim and be happy. You can't fail to atone for your mistakes and be happy. You can't withhold forgiveness from others and be happy. The Course in Miracles teaches us, and this is a rigorous path. This is not a kind of la-la spirituality. It takes discipline. Discipleship is the discipline of I will not, I might be wounded, but I don't have to act from my wound. I might feel anger, but I can know that the anger itself is produced essentially by a misperception of the situation. I give this to God, to the Holy Spirit, to the internal teacher to change my thinking that the anger shall no longer be there. So the idea here is that when we are in a place where life is not working, we take 100% responsibility. Why? Because the Course says if we do not take 100% responsibility, then the price we pay is that we will not be able to change things. That's why this matters in America right now. We gotta change things. Something has happened in this campaign, and to be honest, it's not gonna be over on November 10th. You know, and, and we know this. But this is a, a calling to all of us. The Course in Miracles makes it very clear, whether it's your life that's not working, or your family's life that's not working, or, or your collective, your tribe's life's not working, there is a call there. It is an invitation, and it is often a challenge to ask yourself, where have you been not aligned with love? And, and this, you know, once again, you've, many of you have heard me say this, I'm your aerobic instructor, but I can't do it for you. I'm sitting here. I, when we go into meditation, I'm going through it just like you're going through it. This is why I how I try to stay spiritually in shape, but I can't do it for you. So everybody is responsible for their own thinking. So I hope that you will allow yourself to think now of the places in your life where not only your life might not be working, but where your ego has tempted you to think it's not working because of them. It's not working because of him. It's not working because of her, right? You can't be happy unless you take 100% responsibility what was my part. 
That's why we have to do this as a nation and we have to do it as individuals to atone for our mistakes as well as forgiving other people for theirs. The forgiveness that the Course in Miracles talks about is not, you were a jerk, but I'm very spiritual now, so I, <laughs> I forgive you. No, the Course in Miracles, we're laughing because clearly that's judgment. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is where we remember the first principle of the Course, which is love is real and nothing else exists. So the Course in Miracles presents us a view in which you might say, the world is both self-organizing and self-correcting. Just like the body when it is healthy, you, this cell, serve the, the pancreas, this, this cell, serve the colon, this, this cell, serve the, serve the stomach, this, uh, you know, every, everything serves where it's supposed to serve. We are taught of you where you serve in the arts, you serve in the sciences, you serve in business, you write a script, you write a book, you open a store. That, that we feel this natural intelligence and that we see all of our relationships, as the Course in Miracles calls them, assignments, in which people in our are brought into our lives because people are assigned to each other with whom there is a maximal opportunity for soul growth. Now, the universe is both self-organizing and self-correcting. It is self-correcting meaning, just like the immune system in the body. The humanity would not, the body human body would not have evolved over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years were we not capable of taking a hit. So that when there is injury or there is disease, to a great extent that injury and disease can be absorbed by the system and the immune system sets about healing. Same with societies. Our country has taken a hit. Something's really off. And it's off in so many areas as to feel deeply disturbing to, to the conscious person. It, it's like it's not just police brutality, it's not just environmental, it's not just criminal justice, it's not just what's happening with the political parties, it's not just money and politics, it's not just the educational system, it's not just the, the underclass, you know, the Republicans uh, talk about how everything will be fixed if we serve the, the upper classes, basically, but the Democrats, everything will be sick, fixed if we serve the middle class. Do you know how many millions of people can't even get into the middle class in America? Who speaks for them? And you know where we should be speaking for them? In rooms like this. You know, it was a famous theologian once said that it is the role of, well, actually it was originally said by a, by a journalist, and then it has been taken up by, and I certainly believe it should be the role of all spiritual and religious leadership, to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Too many times religious institutions, we had preachers preaching that slavery was okay in the American South. Too many times the great religious institutions see themselves as following. You know, I was talking to, uh, to Reverend Brown today, and he was talking about someone who would be, be speaking about the churches and saying, we follow the society. Those of us who are on a spiritual path should not see ourselves as followers. We should see ourselves as leaders in the sense that, as, as Lao Tzu said, the leader is someone who does not think of him or herself as a leader, but is a follower of a distant star. And The Course in Miracles talks about how God has the answer to every problem the moment the problem occurs, but we must surrender ourselves to be used for this great purpose of healing and immune system. So yes, our society can take a hit. Our society's taken a hit before. But the answer will not just come. You know, right now we're playing whack-a-mole. You know, it's like this, this person, this, this politician is a problem. We handled it. This particular piece of, the legislation, piece of legislation is wicked. We handled it. This issue is, is, is a problem. We got active and we handled it. There's always something. And that is because at the core, we are not living as who God created us to be. Now, it's not for me to tell you what that looks like. And it's not for you to tell me what that looks like in my life or in your life, but rather just as every cell is imbued with this natural intelligence, so each of us are. And that is why we pray. And that is why we meditate. That is why those of us who are students of the Course in Miracles do that workbook every day. It's no different than physical exercise. You hone your muscles. You build your strength. You counter gravity. Then just as there is physical gravity, 
that you, you know, why do you do weight training? To counter physical gravity. Why do you do spiritual training? To, to counter emotional gravity, psychological gravity, spiritual gravity, that gravity of cynicism and anger and fatigue and that stuff that just pulls us down and makes us victims and makes us whiners. We, we each and every one of us can think of ourselves as an immune system in the country and on the planet. And, and the Course in Miracles calls it the plan of the teachers of God, that each and every one of us has a function. And nobody's function is any more or any less important than anyone else's. And so what we do here every Tuesday night, and this is what Reverend Brown does here on Sunday mornings, what Jackie does on Sunday mornings at Middle Collegiate, what they're going to be doing, at, what they're doing at temples and synagogues all over the world tonight, being doing tomorrow, what they do at all great systems of religious and spiritual teaching is to impart for all of us to embrace at ever deeper levels those universal spiritual themes. You know, my mother, I was telling Reverend Brown today that my mother, when I was growing up, her best friend was a very conservative uh, Christian lady named BJ. And every time somebody did something wonderful, BJ would say, she's such a good Christian, or he's such a good Christian. One day my mother just couldn't take it anymore, and she said, BJ, what do you think a good Jew is? Because every time that she described a good Christian, it was that they'd been a good person. Called to be no different than a Jew is called to be, or Muslim is called to be, or Buddhist is called to be, or just a person of conscience and consciousness is called to be. The problem is not that we're not Christian, or we're not Jewish, or we're not Islam, or we're not Buddhist. That's not the problem. The problem is that we have disconnected from that which is most essentially human about us. And we are all tempted to do that. And what any great religious system is, or any great spiritual path is, is that path which is a guide, the guideposts. And that is what we talk about here every week. Guideposts like, okay, I'm blaming him. What was my part in this? Okay, it's not working. Who am I not forgiving? Okay, where, did, where was I off? Where do I need to atone? Where am I not being merciful? Where am I not being compassionate? Where am I focusing on his or her mistake when it, God knows I've made my own? Where am I not rising to the occasion? Where am I being lazy? Where am I procrastinating? Where am I not standing forth as a child of God? Where am I playing victim? These principles are not difficult, but it can be very difficult to resist. It can be very difficult to deal with our own resistance to practicing them and sometimes to seeing them. I mean, every time I've made my biggest mistakes, I could say this about the last 20, 30 years of my life. The biggest mistakes I've made, theoretically, I should have known better. Theoretically, I knew the principle. But life can get confusing. The ego is very, very insidious. That's why in Christian terms, it's called the silver-tongued devil. The ego doesn't come up to you and go, hi, I'm your self-hatred. <laughs> doesn't come up and say, hi, I'm the aspect and dimension of your thinking, which will make you undermine, self-sabotage, and pretty much ruin everything in your life. <laughs> no, it says, hi. You know, I'm, I'm watching out for number one, self-care. There is, self-care is certainly a legitimate concept. But sometimes these days, the way people use it, it just is a cover for old-fashioned selfishness. And so we need to always be on guard, don't we? Because the ego doesn't say what it is. And so, and we are supported by so many aspects of the society today to take care of number one at the expense of someone else. And any time you're taking care of number one at the expense of someone else, you're not actually taking care of, of number one. Why? Because we are each other. That's the message of The Course in Miracles. That's the metaphysical meaning of the line, there is only one begotten son. There's only one begotten son means we're all it. In the realm of ultimate reality, there's no place where you stop and I start. That's why The Course in Miracles says, if I'm attacking you in my mind, I should think of it as a sword falling down on your head, but it's falling down on mine. So once again, it's not that they're complicated. They're simple enough, but they're very, very different, the core of these principles. The Course in Miracles says the thinking of the world is 180 degrees away from the thinking of God. We have everything upside down, including arrogance and humility. So my hope when you are here is that you leave here 
knowing that there is a power in you but not of you. And in the presence of this power and through this power, as the Course in Miracles says, miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. When your mind is filled with love in any situation, the Course in Miracles says miracles are everyone's right, but purification is necessary first. We must purify ourselves of blaming him, blaming her, not taking responsibility for what I did, etc., etc. Not atoning, not forgiving, not aligning, not being the aspect of my person I should be. And so when we do return to the whole mind, the purified mind, that's the holy mind. As the Course in Miracles says, there is nothing your holiness cannot do. And so we all live our lives out there in the world. It's complicated, especially today with all this stuff, with the political campaign, there's a lot in the air. We are all bombarded constantly by these just stabs of meaninglessness everywhere we turn. And when you go to a place like this, when you come here, when you come to any kind of congregational, you know, that's really the movement now. We can all, we've all read the same books now. We've all listened to the same tapes. We can all sit home and read the book ourselves. And The Course in Miracles is that. It is a self-study program. But there's something that happens in these, in these rooms. You know, The Course in Miracles says, an idea grows stronger when it is shared. That's why in AA you go to the meetings. You know, there's, that's why in the old days this building was built in 1854. A lot of people went to church in those days. You look at the great synagogues, you look at the great, and today the mosques, people go. People are returning to this now, knowing that I could sit home and read the book, but there's something about being in a room with like-minded people. It's so interesting, isn't it? It's, it's a battery charge, and, I, and I, it's, it's fascinating, and I see it, and I experience it. And my hope is that we all leave this room when we leave here, and that's certainly my, my hope and my own intention and, and my dedication in terms of my participation is to articulate principle in such a way that each and every one of us, in whatever way, are, are returned a little bit more, sometimes more and sometimes less, to that alignment of thought which opens the mind and opens the heart and makes us feel two things. Number one, when you leave here, that you have not only a great responsibility to the world, but remember the word responsibility means responsibility but that that ability is provided by God who lives within you, that through that power there is nothing you cannot do. That God has a plan, God has a plan for this nation and for all nations. What we want to avoid and resist is the thought that it's just gone too far, that the planet is screwed now, and you can go there pretty easily. Whether you look at the idea of nuclear or environmental, there are so many forms disaster could take. And there are so many ways to imagine. We're like the Titanic on the, head of, on, on the way to the iceberg. But we want to radically declare that through the grace of God, not through our power alone, but through the power of that which lives within us, we can turn the ship around. That there is a plan in the mind of God that God has a plan, that God has heard our prayers, and he has sent help. He has sent you, he has sent you, he has sent you, and he has sent you. He has sent all of us. The Course in Miracles says many are called, but few are chosen. Actually means everyone's called, few care to listen. So our goal is to answer the call. The Course in Miracles says all of us are special, and none of us are special. You are no better than anyone else. You are no worse than anyone else. The house is the universe. It is wired for electricity. Doesn't matter the shape of the lamp, the size of the lamp, the form of the lamp, or the design of the lamp. What matters is that that lamp is plugged in. With every prayer, we plug in. With every meditation, we plug in. Every time we do any spiritual practice, A Course in Miracles workbook or any other, we plug in. Every time we forgive each other, we plug in. Every time we atone for our own mistakes, we plug in. And then the light will be so bright as to cast out all darkness. And love will be so great as to cast out all fear. And our happiness shall be so great as to wipe away all tears. This will occur because it is God's will, and God's will has never not been done. What is left up to us, ladies and gentlemen, is how long it takes. Are we gonna go now, or are we gonna go later? 
Are we going to take the path of wisdom, or are we going to go down avenues of continued dysfunction and continued unfoldment of suffering for billions of human beings on the planet, which could only get worse if we do not rise up? And for those of us, particularly who are citizens of countries such as ours and such as many that are watching here tonight on live stream, and some perhaps not, but we want to honor our incarnation, whatever your incarnation is. And if you are a citizen of a, of, of, of a democracy, you have, you have none of this, like, oh, there's nothing I can do. There's plenty you can do, each and every one of us. And The Course in Miracles teaches us to wake up every morning and to say to God, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? We're not supposed to wake up in the morning and just figure out, well, what do I want? but what does God within me want? The path of miracles is where you tell God what you'd like him to do for you. The path of, ma that is the ma path of magic, I mean. The path of miracles is where we say, how can I be used? Like in the book of Isaiah, send me. So that is my hope, that each of us leaves here when we leave each other every week with a greater sense of empowerment because of knowing that there is an infinite power that lives within us, a greater sense of responsibility to be there for each other, a greater sense of possibility that we can, in fact, change this world. We believe in the radical action of God's spirit within us and around us and upon us, that things can change, that things will change, that the only instrument through which God can operate is each of us. God cannot do for us what he can cannot do through us, that there is no spot where God is not, that your life doesn't have to be any different than it is now to be a vessel through which you operate, that the relationships in your life, the things you're doing already as they are, are the perfect curriculum, as the Course in Miracles would say, for you to become the man that you're capable of becoming, for you to become the woman that you're capable of becoming. It's all happening right now to the extent to which you make yourself available, or as the Course in Miracles would say, miracle ready. And as we do, this country will transform. As as we do, this planet will transform. Some of it will happen in our lifetime. Some of it will not happen in our lifetime. But even for the changes, it will not happen in our lifetime if we take part in the great transformation and the great conversion of our thinking from fear to love. Then even if we don't see it with our physical eyes before we die, on the day we'll die, we'll know. I did my part. I kicked ass. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For, for those of you who had not been with us before, I wanted to sort of lay out the sort of general sense of kind of why we are here. And then every week we take a particular topic where we, we apply these things in a particular way. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to make a few announcements. And then we're going to talk about whatever you want to talk about. I'll come down there. You'll ask any questions. Uh, you'll get to your bottom line with your question. And I will do my best to reflect upon the issue um, uh, to the best of my ability. But actually, I left something out. Adam, are you here? Uh, it's Adam Isidore tonight? Right, right? Where are you, Adam? Uh, we haven't done our meditation yet. I'm sorry, I forgot. All my talk about how we have to meditate, and then I forgot to meditate. <clears throat> okay. So, atonement. We'll do a meditation now, uh, just as Jews are doing all over the world tonight and tomorrow. Let us join in the vibration of this great and holy, holy principle and allow yourself in your own mind to know that the atonement is, think of it as a cosmic reset button. Buddha was born about 500 years before Jesus. And Buddha described action, reaction. He described the law of karma. The message of Jesus is the idea that in a moment of grace, the karma is burned. What does that mean? Well, in Course in Miracles terms, it means the consequences of your wrong decision are undone. So you don't have to, you know, it means these things that make you cringe. It might have happened a long time ago. It might have happened this morning. But you know in your heart, you got it wrong. You know, sometimes these days people go, oh, don't feel bad. Sometimes the fact you feel bad is because you have a conscience. 
Only sociopaths have no conscience. If you have a sense that, you know, I, people I know in Detroit, this woman, you say, my heart is disturbed. My heart is disturbed. My spirit is disturbed. Yeah. Yeah, when you, when, you, when you feel that something's off, it is usually. And so sometimes we don't know what to do with the, the guilt we feel. And so the atonement is where you, 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 you give it to God. It's not that God forgives you because God never judged you. But we ask forgiveness in the sense of asking for correction of our own perception. And then God responds with infinite mercy and God responds with ways that we can be better people now. And sometimes we become people who are, are deeper and, and improved in ways that are actually better than the people we were before we went through that. And sometimes because we did go through that, we're able to help other people not make the same mistakes that we made. This is very deep and very important. So let us all pray for that new year in the book of life. Join with me, please, and let's close our eyes. <clears throat> On this night, we present ourselves to God, knowing that we are not judged, but knowing that we are healed of our wounds and we are corrected where we have been mistaken when we present ourselves honestly and sincerely to him. Where we have not been kind, we atone. <clears throat> where we have not taken responsibility for ourselves, we atone. Where we have in any way borne false witness towards another, we atone. Any place where we know that we have acted or are acting without integrity, we atone. Where we have been or are being tough on someone, we atone. Wherever we are harsh and not gentle, we atone. Where we have withheld forgiveness and been holier than thou, played God, talked down to others, or look down on others, or not been charitable or generous or compassionate towards others, we atone. Where as a nation, dear God, we have strayed from our own principles, we atone. Where we have placed money before ethics or humanitarian values, we atone where we have been militarist or imperialist, where we have been aggressive, where we have not behaved in alignment with your principles in our relationships to other nations, we atone. Where we have countenanced the disintegration of our politics, we atone. where we have ourselves disengaged, not cared, not participated, not helped, given in to cynicism, anger, victimization, played small, we atone. We atone, dear God, for the mistakes that we know we have made. And we atone for the mistakes we don't even know that we made. But we pray on this night, dear God, that in those places where we have been off, please place us back on the wagon, where we have fallen into a, 
the lesser aspects and dimensions of our own personalities. We atone, heal us, dear God, make all crooked places straight. Heal us of our wounds and lift us high. Where we have been weak, dear God, please make us strong. Where we have lacked courage, make us courageous. Where we have not been the man or the woman that we know you created us to be, dear God, we pray for forgiveness and we pray for the ability to forgive ourselves. And we thank you, dear God, for the clean slate of this night and every night and every day and every moment. Thank you that in the situations of our lives, we can now begin again as we atone for our own mistakes and help us, dear God, forgive others for theirs. Anyone in our life whose guilt and mistakes we focus on, heal us, dear God. May we not focus on the mistakes of others, that others shall not focus on our own. Let us rather see through to the innocence in our brothers. For we are willing to see the innocence in others that we might feel the innocence within ourselves. We pray that your light come upon us every cell and aspect of our being our physical selves, our emotional selves, our psychological selves, every aspect of mind, every aspect of body, every aspect of spirit, pour forth your spirit, dear God. As we open ourselves consciously and willingly to you and pray that you lift us up, lift us high. We pray for the peace that comes from this that we might be the people you would have us be, that we might do what you would have us do. We send our love and our blessing to each other. Our love and our blessing to all the world. And so it is. We say, Adam Isidore.